Good morning, everyone. Come on, give them good morning, everyone. There you go. Good morning to you that are home today at Cross Point Life. We are so blessed that you're watching or will watch this in the days to come. We are honored to be here today. We love Jesus, and we are so glad that we get to be together again. Amen? Come on, somebody. Thanks for being here today. So glad you're here. Let's jump in. It's Father's Day. I bless you, fathers. We're going to pray for you in just a few minutes, but thanks for being here today. I want to talk a little bit this morning, not specifically about fathers, but I want to talk about men. But even in the talk on men, it's going to encompass everybody here, so get ready. But I want to start out with looking at the men's thesaurus. How many knew there was a men's thesaurus? Anybody know there's one out there? There's not. I made it up. Just want you to know. I want to give you a couple things that I've found in the men's thesaurus that I think is very unique for us men. You ready? Men, are you ready? Because I think... I think you're going to represent some of these things. I know I do. Because men don't always say what they mean. Whoa. My wife just said true, very loud. When when, When a man says this, when a man says it would take too long to explain, he means this. I have no idea how it works. Right? I'm sure you've never done that before. When a man says, take a break, honey, You're working way too hard. That's probably a rare one anyway. He means, I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. You're too loud in the kitchen. When a man says, that's interesting, dear. That's really interesting. He's basically saying, are you still talking? (laughs) Dr. Charter, you kind of laughed at that one a little bit too. that, That was not even... When a man says it's a guy thing, he means there's no rational thought pattern connected with this, and you have no chance at all of making it logical. It's a guy thing. When a man says, can I help with dinner? (laughs) He means, why isn't it ready yet? See, the reason you're not responding is because you're making you very uncomfortable because the men's thesaurus has your name in that thesaurus. (laughs) Couple more. When a man says, "Uh uh-huh, sure, honey. Yes, dear. He means absolutely nothing. It's a conditioned response. When a man says, you know how bad my memory is, it's a good one. So my staff know this one. He means, I can't remember the theme song, the Hogan Tiros. Nobody knows that one anyway. The phone number of the first girl I ever kissed and the vehicle identification number of every car I've owned. But, yes, I did forget your birthday. What a man says, oh, don't fuss. I just cut myself. This is me. It's no big deal. Seriously, not a big deal. I'm pulling it apart, seeing how deep it is. Here's what it really means. I have probably severed a limb, but it will bleed. I will bleed to death before I admit it. I'm hurt, so get over here and help me right now. Last one, last one. When a man says, you know I could never love anyone else, he means... I used to, I, I'm used to the way you yell at me and realize it could be worse. Not a good one, guys, not a good one. How about this one? When a man says, I'm lost, I know exactly where we are. Ladies, what's he saying? I'm lost, I have absolutely no idea where we are. This morning, I feel in the context of the atmosphere in this house, I don't know about you, but There's something just so wonderful about gathering together. I just feel even this morning, it's been good. These last three months, we've been meeting online. We've gathered a few of us here almost every single week to preach live on Facebook. There's been six, seven, eight of us in the building that have done various parts of the service. But there's something about when we come together with expectation. Many of you are so excited, have anticipated this moment. And you can feel it in the atmosphere, can't you? You can feel it. You say, well, it's just different. Listen, we are in a season, we're in a time where things are different and probably will continue to be different for a while. But I want to speak today to the topic at hand, and that's this idea that even if things never go back to the way they once were or as we once knew them, what are we going to do as in particular Men of God, but in general, all of us together, what are we going to do to navigate these times? We've done well the last three months. 
I must just tell you, I'm proud of all of you that are here and those that are watching. I'm proud of how you've navigated this season. It's not been easy. It's been hard. Being self-isolated and, and at home in our houses has not been an easy task, but you've done it, and I would say you've done it well. But because we're living in a time of, of the unexpected, we don't know what's going to happen next. I heard this the other day. I think I shared it on Facebook Live a few, few number of days ago, but I heard one of the prophets in the nation said that we're in a season like a woman who's giving birth, and prior to the birth of the baby, there are what? There are contractions. Tana's here. She knows this very, very well. They have contractions. She's a nurse. They, they have contractions. And the church, the world's in a time of contractions, getting ready to give birth to something. Here's what I want you to hear. I believe God's preparing us for something so profound and so amazing. I'm not saying he brought COVID-19. I'm not saying that uh, what's happening in our nation is a direct result of God bringing uh, 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 an awareness of, of racism in our nation. These things are, are on our radar right now, and they should be. They ought to be things we're paying attention to. We, not, we need to pay attention to our health, obviously. We need to pay attention to what's going on in our own cities, in our nation, and our world as it relates to the injustice of racism. But I want to talk this morning to you about what it looks like to be the man. I'm using that term again, very, very general, very loosely, but I want you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 says these words. Ezekiel 22, I think it's 22, verse 30, let me, yes, says this. So I sought a for a man. I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. And listen to these words, but I found no one. I found no one. God searching the then known world for a man, in particular a man, that would stand in intercession is literally what this means. He would stand in intercession. Father, I pray out for the people that don't know you. God, I'm crying out for you right. Please, God, hear my cry. And it says here in, in, in this passage, he could find no one. I am grateful this morning that the Lord, and he is looking for a man. He's looking for a people that will stand in the gap and intercede for a people. I know there are men this morning in this room and they're watching that we'll watch that are men of intercession, people of prayer. And I high five you this morning and I say thank you for your intercession. Keep praying, keep standing in the gap. But I want to talk just for a moment about the, the idea that's found here in verse 30. For I sought for a man. I sought for someone. I want to give you, and I was thinking this morning of your worshiping. Some of you might remember this, many of you probably won't. But over the many, many years that we've been contending for God's presence, we have believed that we have been in transitional, uh, uh, I'll say it this way, um, crossing over moments from the east side to the west side, a very familiar phrase at cross point. And we believe that we don't cross one time, but we will cross many times over the river from one place on the river shore to the other side of the shore. It's a crossing over. It's a type of a threshold. And at first I thought maybe not a good analogy, but honestly it's a great analogy for where we are right now. Because if the contractions are true, if we've had a couple of contractions already with COVID and, and now with, with the racial uh, uh, tension in the land, that I personally, let me just touch on this, I personally believe when you really listen to those that are out there and, and are involved with it, I believe God is doing something phenomenal that other, other agencies are not reporting. I forwarded something yesterday about what's happening in Atlanta. 10,000 people gathered in the city of Atlanta, Christians worshiping, contending, and believing God for a move. How about you? Isn't that exciting? I thought that was awesome. Where was the reporting of that one? How about yesterday in San Diego? 
Nearly 7,000 plus people gathered on the streets of San Diego from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning praying, if my people will humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. I think there's a healing taking place. Please hear my heart. I'm not saying it's an easy thing. I'm not saying it's, it's something that's going to happen quickly, but it is something that's happening. And I think God's asking this morning, looking at you, looking at me, looking at us, going, will you be my people? Will you be that person that, that he seeks after? For I sought a man. I sought a person that I could trust to pray and intercede on behalf of, in this case, Israel, on behalf of a nation, on behalf of the world, on behalf of our cities. I want to talk just a few moments about some focal points of what it looks like in being the man. Let me understand that when we, we, we live in a place, in a posture, that the, the government of God is always advancing. God's government of which we belong, doesn't stay idle. It doesn't stay in one place. It doesn't just spiral and go nowhere. It's a government that's constantly advancing and moving. Therefore, we as his people can never afford to sit idly by and just wait for everything to happen. We're in the most, most opportune time possible to be able to give away what we carry and who we are as people of God. There's no way to explain the fact that when we go from, from, let's say, the east side to the west side, it's going to require something of us if we're going to take new territory, if we're going to, to be the people that God's called us to be. It's going to require some things of us that won't be comfortable at times. It's going to require an uncomfortability, I guess you could say. Change is never easy for any of us. But change is in the air. We have no choice but to make a decision to go with the change and not resist the change. I hate wearing this thing more than you. I just hate it. I feel like I've got an ascot on right now. Hello. Right? You know what ascots are? I don't like them. But guess what? It's required of us right now. And we will get through this. And there will be a day when this thing will be off of us. But until the day, how will we navigate this thing? We'll navigate it by faith through God. He'll give us help when we need help. Let me, let me give you these focal points very quickly. Number one, the first focal point of, of Ezekiel 22, 30. So I sought for a man among them. The first thing I want you to hear is this. It costs something for your freedom. Now, I'm not talking specifically about the freedom we have in America, although I think that freedom is being rocked right now. I think there's a war and a battle being fought in the unseen realm that's trying to take away the things that we have embraced and held to and have had the privilege of for so long. I believe that. I read just a couple of articles, even this morning, that the, the, there, there's a movement even today across our nation in, in Washington, D.C. and a couple other major cities across our land where, where the, 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 uh, the followers of Lucifer, Satan, are gathering together and they're beginning to pray against our nation, against our president. That shouldn't surprise any of us. But you know what surprises me? They've been emboldened. Now they're going to gather they call Luciferians, Luciferians, they're going to now gather in places across our nation and they're going to begin to do what they believe they're supposed to do to bring anarchy, to bring a revolt, to bring a resistance to the things of God. I have a question. We, we are not bound by uh, the things of this earth. We've been freed by God and by what he did for us on the cross. In, in Exodus chapter 11, a few, few weeks ago, we celebrated Passover. Remember that? And we believe that Passover was a part of the breaking of, of the season we're in with COVID-19. And if you listen to, to, to the media reports, you might think nothing's shifted. But I believe with all my heart that things have shifted. Things have could have been way worse than what we're seeing today. But God 
put blood on the threshold above your door. And if, when I come by, I will pass your household and I will not kill your firstborn. The blood of Jesus paid a price. He shed his blood on a cross so that you and I can do what? We can be passed by the spirit of death, passed over for what sin said. The Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of God's standard. But if we who, who are alive today and don't confess Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we don't have relationship with him, guess what happens? We take our last breath on this planet. We are not going to spend eternity in heaven with God. There's another place that has been prepared, and it will be a place for those that choose to reject the love and the goodness and the kindness of God. God sent his son so that you and I might have life and have it abundantly, John 10.10. 10. He paid a price on the cross so that while he hung on that cross, shed his blood, and died on our behalf, they led him into a borrowed tomb. And for three days, he was in that tomb, but on the third day, he came out. It's called resurrection life. We have resurrection life today. What am I trying to say? I'm saying it costs something for you and I to be able to do what we do today. We have freedom in the name of Jesus. We have freedom in the name of Jesus to, to release the power and authority over people. We are free because of what God did. There was a sacrifice so that you and I could cross over, if you will, from the east side to the west side. It costs something. And I believe that you and I need to understand for us to advance in this season, it's going to cost something. It's probably already cost some of you something. But don't be afraid of the cost. Don't be afraid of the willingness on your behalf to give something away so that you can be everything that God wanted you to be. Maybe it's time for you to, to sacrifice something, kill something. What's the scripture talk about in John? I believe if, if a seed falls to the ground, and, and it's, it's got to die first before it can thrive. Maybe there's some things right now that we need to give to God and let it die so he can raise it the way it needs to be raised. Maybe the spirit of control that some of us have has got to die. He sought for a man. He's looking for men. He's looking for women. He's looking for people that understand that this first focal point is it cost us him, it cost something for us to walk in freedom. The second focal point is this God wants you thinking clearly. He wants you to think clearly. In Joshua chapter 3, uh, verse 4, let me read it to you real quickly. I'm sorry, I wasn't planning on turning there, but I think I need to. Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, reads like this. <clears throat> Yet there should be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by me measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Hear the heart of Pastor Barry this morning. We have not passed this way before. We are in a season where we need clear thinking. We are in a season when God is looking for men that will think the way that he thinks. He's looking for men. He's looking for women. He's looking for sons and daughters that will ask the Father, what is it you're saying to us in this moment, in this hour, in this season? It's easy to lose our way when pursuing these new advances or these, this new place that we're in. Some of you have been sheltered at home. Some of you are still working, but it's different. I don't know about you, but I think because of the uncertainty of where we are, it's important that we make sure that we have his heart, have his thoughts, have his mind as we navigate this future. Sometimes we think this thing's never going to lift. It will lift. We would get past this. You say, what about, the, what about the, uh, the contractions? Friends, I don't know what tomorrow holds. The Bible's very clear. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We have our today. Tomorrow is its own issue. But until we get to that day, we live today with the understanding that God is in control and he wants us clear-headed. He wants us thinking clearly because when the fog does lift and when this stuff whatever normalcy looks like, when we start going back to something that feels familiar, he's going to be looking for people that have been thinking clearly. You say, well, I haven't been thinking clearly. Start today. 
Ask the Father today. If it doesn't happen today, start tomorrow. Don't give up on asking God to give you clarity. The next thing I want to share with you, a focus point is this, number three, is that I want to ask you the question, how hungry are you? Matthew chapter five, verse six, he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be what? Filled. Are you hungry right now for God's goodness? Are you hungry right now for the more of God? Have you, have you put on the coat rack of your life, the supernatural life that you were fighting for before COVID, before all this other stuff transpired? Or, or is now supernatural life, was, was, was supernatural living predicated on the convenience of a church that fights and fought for the supernatural activity in its atmosphere and its, its building? Because if that's the case, you miss the point. It was never about what happened inside the walls. It was always about what happened inside of you. That when God did something inside of you, you were to take that, you were to take the, the hunger and the desire and the passion and get out of this building and be the ecclesia. That has not changed. As a matter of fact, I would say that probably it's more important today than it was even three months ago that you live the life of the ecclesia outside the walls of Cross Point. Another focal point has got to be this. Be careful who you hang with and who you associate with and what you listen to. This is not a new message. We've, we've taught this before. But you will develop very quickly a doctrine. I'm not talking biblical doctrine. I'm talking a worldview doctrine that does not reflect the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You'll begin to have a worldview that reflects the culture in which you live, not the culture of heaven. We cannot afford to be a people that look like, talk like, act like the rest of the world because we are not a part of this world. Men of God, we do not belong to this planet. But until he comes back, God has asked every one of us in this room to walk like him, to talk like him, and to raise up our banner that says, my Jesus, my God, my Father in heaven is in charge of all things and whatever banner he raises, I'm going to raise. Whatever he speaks, I'm going to speak. We must live even more today by faith and not by sight than ever before. I think I'll just land this plane with another focal point, and this focal point is this one. We, we must pay attention. We must pay attention to the character of our hearts. Ezekiel says that God was looking for a man, but he couldn't find a man who was willing to intercede. God's looking for people today that are willing to pray, to fight, to declare, to love, to do the things of the kingdom. I wonder sometimes if the reason we're not so good at being the ecclesia is because we haven't paid attention to the character of our lives. Walking in integrity, developing character greatly assists your advancement in the kingdom, advancement in the world. It boils down to what motivates us. What, what is it that compels us to want to be like God? What is it that causes us to pursue his nature and his character? This morning we ask God to give us more of his heart. Father, give us more of you. It's a great request, but it can't be lip service. God, what areas of my life have I allowed the world's ways to influence my decisions, to influ influence how I love, to influence how I see the world around me? What tree, what tree am I living out of? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. Maybe this is the day 
has, has come to take a serious moral inventory and say, not only do I want to give just a little part of me, but I want to give God all of me. I want to come out of this thing different than when I started. I don't know about you guys, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying as best I can to be as authentic as I can during this, these last three months. And I've confessed a few times on Facebook Live, I've confessed to a few others that my Bible reading has been really strong, but my prayer life hasn't been what it should be. And I finally, I finally heard some of my friends say, Barry, it's, it, you're, you're okay. We all respond to these difficulties in different ways. But the thing I want to come out of with this is I want to come out with a new trajectory of my understanding of the goodness of God. I want to come out of it with a new trajectory that my focus is on him alone. I want to come out of it emotionally, physically, spiritually uh, 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 stronger. And if I don't, then I'm not going to be discouraged, but I'm going to start then. I'm never going to give up on my pursuit of crossing over to the destiny God has for us. How about you today? Now, just la I'll land the plane with this thought. Who leads you will determine your destiny. Who are you following? Who's really, who's really the Lord of your life? Who, who really is the voice that speaks into your life and gives you direction when you need the most direction? Who is it that helps fuel your fire? There's so much more we could say on that, but I gave you just a few focal points, focus points on what it looks like to be the person that God is looking for. I'm looking for a man to stand the gap. I pray the blessing of God on every man. I pray, God, that you would, in your infinite goodness and glory, you would speak clearly to the men of this congregation, to the men of the body of Christ in San Diego, to the ecclesia, and that God on this day, in this hour, there would be determination to not look left, right, or behind, but to keep their eyes fixed on you, Jesus. And in the midst of difficulty, the body of Christ will rise up, we will stand, and we'll be a, to be for, uh, uh, a force to be reckoned with. We, we will not be disillusioned to believe that there's not something more sinister behind everything that's taking place. The evil one wants his best, does his best to destroy us, to kill us. But my God, my God, who lives inside of me, said, son, I'll go before you. I have made a way for you when no one else could have made a way. And will you follow that way? Father, thank you for this wonderful day we have. Thank you for fathers. We honor the dads. God, I thank you for the godly father I had. I thank you for the legacy that he imparted to me. I thank you today, God, I'm serving you because of a dad that served you, because of a grandfather that served you, because of a great-grandfather that served you. And God, I thank you that my son is serving you, that my kids are serving you, and that, God, we believe that our sons and daughters will serve you. We decree it, we declare it today in Jesus' name. And I bless every dad in your name. Father, we pray.